few words about the Herz Lab. What we try to do is we try to connect technology and science with art and the, uh, artists and the public. Of course, that's, uh, I think, what every institution uh, is willing to do and trying to do. And what we are working in is uh, we are an interdisciplinary research institution and uh, we are developing uh, several um, types of art forms that, uh, independent of music or or visual, so let's say audiovisual art. And uh, we do this in performing research and development residences. We invite uh, several artists here to work at ZKM, provide them with techn technology, with assistance, or with uh, space and uh, gear. We do uh, produce uh, works, that's our basic aim, which are, for example, presented here. You see in this exhibition many of the works. And uh, we do as well concerts, events, and uh, 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 symposiums like this one. As well as publications uh, in either CD, DVD, or book format. And uh, let me now go come to, the, to the, the topic of artificial intelligence. I, work, I personally work with computer-aided algorithmic composition since the 80s, so that's quite a long time ago. And for me, of course, this is a new field, uh, algo, uh, algo, um, artificial intelligence, but they are, I see it as a continuum of development, and I try to show a little bit of this continu continuity. In terms of strategy, there are, I find there are very, uh, three basic strategies which you can find in the history of com uh, computing and, uh, uh, let's say, creative computing, uh, especially in music. And this is a generative, uh, mo I think most of the composers in the past worked with generative systems. Several as well with stochastic uh, operations. I mean, you know, I will pr present some of the names uh, later on. Uh, using random as a creative uh, uh, tool. And only recently in the 80s or late 80s constraints were, uh, came, uh, joined this, this uh, strategy. Uh, to maybe some of you don't know what constraints, what the difference between generative and constraint is. Uh, generative means uh, create a, a, a node and create the next node one step higher. That's a generative approach. I have a clear result and reproducing this result gives the same. Uh, stochastic, of course, is randomness, uh, create any node. Uh, and constraints is, for example, create several nodes, but don't create parallel movements. For example, that would be a constraint. And that's a very interesting topic because the technique of composition is a lot of, uh, in a lot of cases, is constrained composition. If you compose a fugue, you avoid this and this and this and this and that, but it is not uh, describe what you should do. So there are windows. Uh, closed and certain windows open and inside of these windows several solutions are possible. And uh, some of the strategies like Markov chains are a combination of these main uh, strategies. So we have these uh, three, I mean, main element and I think we can apply these uh, strategies as well to artificial intelligence systems. If you have a GAN, you have a discriminator, an active uh, network and uh, both uh, work a little bit like a uh, generative and a constraint uh, 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 ge uh, generator. So to go back into the history, I mean, we start with, uh, or at least this is a known uh, or most common knowledge, we start with Mozart 1793, stochastic operations. We, in digital format, we start with Hiller and uh, Isaacson in 1958 already. Senak has used a lot of uh, stochastic operation in his, all of his instrumental and as well uh, electroacoustic uh, compositions. And what is not so much known is Gottfried Michael Koenig's project, uh, pro uh, Project One from 1964, where he uh, created an engine to uh, uh, create, uh, to define parameters for uh, instrumental composition. Uh, Basically, the input is, or let's say the output of the project one is a score for instrumental players. And that's what he worked, what he used uh, for a lot of his composition. 
then there's a, l a big gap somehow, uh, but uh, somehow I was coming to David Cope's EMI, uh, Artificial Intelligence System, and Francois Pachet's Continuator. And both are uh, first of first uh, artificial intelligence uh, systems. And uh, they, we should distinguish these early systems because they were f most of the time rule-based. Uh, I was uh, uh, um, in a con conference in 90, I think it was in 92, where he presented his system in Stanford University. Uh, was an interesting coincidence, and it was astonishing uh, to see that these systems were already able to produce these results. Of course, it's not machine learning, it's not big data which were in, included in these systems, but uh, you can understand the implementation of rules uh, somehow as well as a kind of machine learning, so uh, even though it is not automated uh, uh, learning. Uh, like uh, what we would understand under machine learning. Um, if we continue, we have works like uh, Film Plots in 2016, we have pop songs created with uh, artificial intelligence, but still these, uh, these works were quite um, curated by the audience. So, of course, it's not, uh, there is no, none of these engines work uh, as an artist on its own. We know, we know all of this, but I think it is, it is interesting to know where uh, and what function the artist has in these systems, how aut uh, autonomous uh, these systems work. Um, we have uh, quite a big deviation of uh, um, activities in this field, and this is uh, documented by the existence of these platforms, all working in the music context, and all basically using uh, artificial intelligence strategies uh, and they, they kind of want to reinforce us to work more with, a, uh, with, a, with the tool of artificial intelligence. There was a, a quote, uh, there is someone said artificial intelligence is more, currently more like a, a cyborg system which helps a composer to do things he could not do. So it's a combination between machine and, and uh, human creativity. That's how it is now. And uh, we know that the ability of these machines are growing, of course. The machines getting faster. The strategies are getting more refined. But what I found more interesting is uh, what uh, in the future this artificial intelligence system will do with sound itself. There are, there are several, I mean, very general strategies like filtering or uh, convolution, which uh, change the, the quality of um, uh, a sound itself. Um, but there are not so many st uh, systems which can address uh, the, the modification of sounds very specifically. Specific, specifically. So I'm looking very forward to this, forward to this uh, uh, strategies, you, you can understand the problem is a sample itself is not containing a lot of information. What is containing the information is the fast Fourier analysis which understands the quality, the content of the sound. So you need to window uh, analyze sounds and work on these windowed uh, um, uh, parameters or metadata uh, as you can uh, thing which describes the sound and this makes it more complex to work on sound itself. It's uh, probably comparable to uh, object recognition in a pixelized uh, 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 film um, where, you cannot, where you see that uh, the pixel itself con doesn't contain a lot of information but the uh, two-dimensional plot of pixels in addition to the third dimension of time uh, this is the, the information which is uh, important for us. And uh, I'm looking forward to um, these developments uh, in, in the direction of sounds because here the most of the strategies are very uh, visually focused. Um, and finally, before I go over to uh, Herr Hoffmann, Mr. Hoffmann, and, uh, I want to add this uh, quote uh, that uh, of course, we all know that in the future we will have 
a quantum uh, change when we introduce complex artificial intelligence which have which include as well uh, emotional strategies as well as social strategies. So we need to understand uh, the uh, artificial intelligence as, let's say, one part of our brain. And since our brain is a cooperation of different abilities, uh, we get the strength of creativity. And we have to see how successful these uh, cooperations between these parts are. But uh, I think there will be definitely a time where we can uh, answer this question. So let me hand over to Yannick Hoffmann, who will introduce you to certain examples of uh, production of artificial intelligence we have done here in uh, the Herz Lab. Welcome to a lecture of the Herz Lab on the current activities of the laboratory in the field of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Well, as a transdisciplinary artistic research and development platform, the Herz Lab hosts quite multifaceted artists as part of its Artists in Residence program. In the following, I'm trying to give an overview on a variety of machine learning implementations hailing from the open source world we and our guest artists have used or reconfigured already. And I will put a focus on computer vision, natural language processing, sound and music. So first of all, the Deep World Wiki by Marco Kempf and Simon Zimmermann has been conducted at KIM at the University of the Arts Karlsruhe. Um, then, there is an uh, then there exists an installation version um, which gained production support from ZKM as part of the EC-funded project Interfaces. As part of Deep World, artificial countries were generated using neural networks. Marco Kempf used data of all existing countries, which is basically 193, and um, besides descriptors, he generated both new musical anthems as well as new national flags. So for the um, new national anthems, he used a recurrent neural network while he was using a deep uh, convolutional generative adversarial network um, for the generation of musical anthems. So um, I'm presenting to you the flag of the artificial country, Geo. Let's have a quick listening to the um, national anthem of the land, Geo. I see none of you stood up. But anyway, uh, this work critically reflects on uh, the idea of uh, national identities and it presents us with a view of the world we live in from the eye of an alternative intelligence. So, um, well, the DC gun Marco Kempf used, um, used to produce, I would say, uh, stamp-sized uh, image results. Uh, one of its later successors, the Pro gun, um, outperforms it quite easily. And this I will demonstrate you um, with the next clip. Um, for Flickr AI, uh, for Flickr AI, Daniel Heist uh, used quite a powerful image data set which was um, developed here at the ZKM. So there are more than 50,000 images which were taken by ZKM visitors in a photo booth in the entrance hall. So um, this work is loosely based on Flickr A by Peter Weibel and Matthias Gommel. So all of the faces um, you can see in the background um, are generated by the artificial intelligence. This work uh, currently runs um, on the huge projection wall on the ZKM cube. Uh, well, so uh, late 2018, a team around Tero Karas at uh, NVIDIA presented StyleGun, and uh, so I would say this is state of the art now, and it's capable of uh, creating even better hyper-realistic images but uh, <laughs> computing time on a single GPU is ridiculously long, as I would say. So, um, 
one cannot simply uh, throw on a Google Colab cloud instance which would shut off after t uh, 12 hours. So um, you actually need to have proper gear um, to, to render uh, such um, hyper-realistic um, images. And this is something which especially the young artist generation does not necessarily have at hand. So this throws us back into a period of time such as uh, the 90s when computing power um, was very, very expensive and the young artist generation could not afford it. So they needed to work together with um, institutions who then provided a framework for them to explore the huge machinery. So, uh, by the way, uh, it is also a gun colorizing your grandmother's uh, black and white family pictures. Um, in these examples, however, um, you can see MASK RCNN, uh, which is a region-based convolutional neural network. And um, I found out that especially the benchmark implementation uh, developed by Facebook artificial intelligence research um, gives us quite fast and efficient results in image segmentation. So. Um, this can also be seen um, in the entrance hall. There is a work produced by um, Daniel Heiss, which is called Bentham's Tower. So uh, this reflects on the idea of the panopticon given by the British philosopher Jeremy Bentham. Thus it is called Bentham's Tower. Um, at the Computer Vision Laboratory at the University of Nottingham, they researched into 3D facial reconstruction from a single image. It creates a ready-to-use 3D model from a single portrait image, and the live demo and code can be found on their website, and you can try it out. Um, so uh, actually, I just show it to you as it is great fun to try out when you have some spare time. Um, yeah, but in general, the 3D reconstruction from 2D image data holds great potential. Mm. So open post implementations can run on state-of-the-art edge computing devices with very, very low power consumption and perform key point extraction of human body features on both static and moving images. Open pose is quite a very um, handy tool that can um, get integrated into interactive installations that rely on the mapping of um, full body user interactions um, to control data. Uh, image style transfer is particularly known for superimposing the Van Gogh style on an image of the city of Tübing. It can, however, do way more than that. So um, you have a content and a style image, and using a convolutional neural network, the content image adopts the style of the content image. So um, this procedure has its pendant in audio. Um, though it's basically um, transferring an approach which is hailing from the realm of computer vision, um, using it for the domain of audio. So it was uh, pushed forward uh, by guys just like uh, Ulyanov and Mittal, and it's basically yeah, the transposition of computer vision-based approaches. The content audio uh, for this example, which I will show you now, uh, has been recorded uh, in New York. It's a field recording from a construction site. So this is just an extract from a composition by Lutger. And um, now we will uh, superimpose the style of the sound onto the sound which I recently showed to you. So while um, the style transfer approach in the visual domain throws results which uh, are breathtaking as one might say. Um, I would say in the domain of audio uh, the results are acceptable but there is probably some potential. <laughs> so uh, I'll go to the next field, natural language processing minus understanding. I will demonstrate this on an example uh, which is a work in progress. Uh, artistic work I uh, currently do with uh, Daniel Hayes. It is uh, the podcast. So um, with the podcast, Daniel and I will launch a fake news-based show on the web radio. Podcast will also exist as an hourly automated fake news broadcast uh, for this showroom. 
Um, and as part of this, um, a text-to-speech synthesizer will play back different fake news items during the show. And the trending topics, the current trending topics are crawled regularly from um, the web and processed using OpenAI's GPT-2 medium-sized model. Gong, here's the ZKM Center for Art and Media with fake news. This project is currently under development, but I want to present you with early stage textual results, which are quite funny. Uh, so Daniel asks, can you tell me a joke? And the machine answers, don't waste your life in conversation. Silence is a fundamental living principle. It's a natural defense system designed to give us refuge from the pain of socialized misery and pain of hypermasculinity. Well, and this was only the small sized version of that model. So let's go a little bit further to the medium sized model. Uh, it tells the following joke. Um, a guy, one of the guys said to me, I'm a doctor and I see a lot of people dying and dying a lot of times. And that's why I'm so worried about them dying, for instance. That's a scene from A Gentleman's Guide to Suicide. Okay, so uh, you, you see you can experiment with different um, temperatures, so either the machinery produces results which are yeah, um, quite realistic, while if you yeah, increase the temperature, it will become very, very creative and it will try to yeah, make up things which are just ridiculous. Um, however, if you test it in the so-called giant language model test room, um, as you can see, the results um, are they are very good in so far that they can trick machines um, and they um, appear to be human-produced uh, textual outputs. Switching to sound and music, I want to present a, a special project to you. So, um, with fantasy number one, the artist duo Quadrature presents an audiovisual performance for organ, AI, and radio telescope. This work was created during their B. Beethoven Fellowship, uh, and it was produced by Podium Esling and the ZKM. Its premiere took place um, two weeks ago in Esling in the St. Dionys Church. So here, um, let's skip that. Here you see the radio telescope, which literally listens to the universe. So um, the received electromagnetic waves are transferred into the audible range, causing beeping and other noises. And then the artists on stage react live to incoming signals with a set of parameters. Selection and filtering processes are used, and an algorithm transcribes the noise of space into MIDI notes. Those then get played back by uh, the organ um, with the help of an electronic device called the Orgomat. A neural network gradually takes control and uh, literally searches for traces um, of man-made sounds. So uh, the AI, if you uh, allow me to anthropomorphize it um, for a second, <laughs> begins to fantasize about the familiar in the foreign, which is quite a poetic approach, as for my opinion. So um, this piece was developed in collaboration with uh, the media artist and developer Christian Lozart, who implemented um, real-time harmonization of the incoming signals by the implementation of the Piano Genie model, which is based on the very well-known Yamaha ePiano competition data set. Um, but he also uses a recurrent neural network, which he calls uh, Polyphone RNN, and this one has been specially trained on over 300 Bach Chorals. So um, with this, I will conclude my part, and I uh, kindly ask my colleague Lisa Benzel to come to the rostrum. So hello, thanks uh, for introducing me. Um, it's my pleasure now to. Um, tell you something about future projects we will launch, uh, specifically to residency projects. One is in cooperation uh, with the ZKM, uh, the ZKM cooperation with the French IRCOM, uh, an Institute for the Research about um, Music and Sound. Um, this research project is already going on for quite some time, and the latest two residents we selected, they will both work uh, with music sound and artificial intelligence. And um, please excuse that I did not use any images because both 
projects will take place in the domain of sound, which is usually not so uh, impressive, and uh, will also take place in the future. So there's a rather zero minus image material. Uh, first project I would like to introduce you quickly is uh, Giulia Lorusso, Italian composer, and she proposed a project to realize both at the IRCAM and at the ZKM Herz Lab, which she entitled New Perspectives on Generative Sound Environments via Localized Structured Prediction. So what she basically likes to do is um, to treat AI as a compositional tool, and during her research uh, during her residency period, she would like to research to um, train to generate and to train a generative algorithm uh, with sound samples. So basically, what my colleague Yannick Hoffmann just introduced that there is quite a potential um, to use sound samples, and we have the um, the different situation that whenever you have uh, like an image and you can upscale it uh, in the pixels, there is not so much uh, corresponding uh, algorithmic architectures that can also upscale a sample into a bigger sample, that's so to say. So we are very much looking forward uh, to having her here and uh, to present her final result. Second uh, project in cooperation with the IRCOM is a residency by Norwegian composer and programmer Anders Vinja. Again, no image. And he also plans to work on an architecture uh, which we are looking forward to have and he will share with us. Um, he plans to develop a working environment for AI composition and since he's already a pioneer in that domain, he um, developed already um, uh, a contribution to um, the open music language uh, for Linux. So we think he will build on his experience and he will also train uh, the algorithm on the open Linux 7 library, library 7, uh, to develop uh, an architecture and through that, of course, obviously later on he will compose with it. Switch to what we are doing uh, right now. We just closed an open call on Emotional AI, that's uh, one topic we would like to specifically highlight. And maybe a few words, words on emotional AI in general. What is emotional AI? So it, it does not really differ from, yeah, from any artificial intelligence we've been talking about yesterday and we'll be talking about the rest of the day. But we talk about emotional AI specifically whenever an AI is designed to interact with a human being directly through emotions. So you have either an algorithm that is designed to act really empathic, or you, of course, when you train your algorithm to interact with the original human emotion. Um, techniques you have, we've seen one yesterday. Uh, thanks, Albert. <laughs> uh, you used something like this. Uh, in your performance, but rather more uh, eloquently, because this is already from 2015, it's a little bit outdated, I would say. Uh, but you have several techniques like emotion detection uh, in facial uh, recognition or in speech recognition. You have uh, sentiment analysis in text. So we could also analyze the text uh, Yannick Hoffmann just presented uh, in terms of his emotional state. Um, you can otherwise also use variables or even implant them in your own body if you prefer uh, that detect the pulse or the tension of your skin um, or your brain waves, for example, through an EEG headset. And all this information can be fed into the computer. So that's more or less how we talk about emotional AI. You can, of course, also use this within an artwork. I just put that example here because it was displayed until recently within the exhibition. That's a work by uh, Coraline Vogelaar. And um, of course, I would like to shortly explain why we chose that particular topic, uh, why emotional AI specifically. There are tons of reasons. I highlight a couple of them. Uh, one reason why emotional AI seems very interesting to us is uh, because it connects closely with the actual origins of artificial intelligence as we use it today. It connects to early, early cybernetics. Uh, thanks a lot to Thomas Feuerstein, uh, who presented yesterday already uh, some origins. Uh, he went back to the steersman. Uh, I would rather go not that far, but only to Norbert Wiener. You see him here. Uh, 
having a conversation uh, through uh, an apparatus. And um, early cybernetics, as it was coined by him and some fellows, is dedicated to the interaction between human and machine. So when you have emotional AI, of course, this is about communication and about the interaction between a human uh, and a machine. And um, this is an interesting connection we like to make. Secondly, emotional AI does also fit in a broader research topic, which is, uh, most of you might know it, uh, effective computing. It was, as it was coined by Rosalind Picard, already in the 90s. At the time, it did not involve so much of artificial intelligence. Um, but we talk about um, effective computing whenever there's anything made uh, to make the communication of human and machine more intuitively. Uh, you have emoticons, but you can also go as far as uh, using an algorithm to uh, directly interact uh, with human beings through emotions and affections. So we find it interesting to connect artificial intelligence, emotional artificial intelligence to that um, already long existing research topic uh, and the notion of effective computing. Well, um, there are several other reasons, of course, besides emotional AI being a perfect fit for all kinds of artistic uses, since it's focus on communication and empathy. Uh, but one of the other reasons uh, for us to additionally highlight specifically emotional AI is um, yeah, it's sort of underdog position, although there is, of course, a huge... Um, yeah, business around also emotional AI. Um, it's, uh, it's an underdog uh, besides the huge buzzword of general artificial intelligence. Uh, so we, we basically take a focus on that particular aspect and um, a focus that also um, does connect with elements like soft power, for example, with the ethics of care. You can just imagine that you would need to take care of your algorithm because it is empathic. So this is an interesting aspect we would like to highlight. Uh, and just imagine that you would also need to take care about everything connected to your algorithm. So just to give you some, some insights. I stop here for today. And um, if anything of what we said uh, seems interesting to you, uh, please check uh, our program, our schedule, because we will just we just selected four participants. We're just in the middle of selecting four participants for the emotional AI residency. They will come to the Herz Lab, and uh, we are eager to present the projects they are developing, and hopefully also within a greater theoretical framework. As well as, of course, we are looking forward to present uh, the works and and the programs developed by Giulia Russo and Anders Vigna uh, in the future. Thank you for your patience.